Good afternoon and welcome to another episode of Made in Quakes TV. It's Wednesday, it's a little bit later than we normally start and I'll explain why that is shortly. Um, my guest this evening was slightly delayed. Um, so you are all very welcome. Um, I'm going to reveal my guest in a moment just after I invite him. So it's a, an old boy of the school who... Uh, who is not sure which channel to join, so you'll see in a minute. <laughs> uh, let us just uh, do the invitation. Those who are joining, um, and our fingers crossed. So I'm delighted to be joined by a very special guest this afternoon, who left Quags in 1997, um, and you will have heard of him. So I'm hoping he will appear very shortly. We didn't get the chance to practice. Okay, so it's not happening just yet. So thank you for your patience. <laughs> okay, so thank you for those joining us. We are just waiting for our guest to join this afternoon. And here he is. There we are. Good afternoon, sir. How are you? You all right? I'm great, thank you. So, um, as I can now reveal, our guest this afternoon is Mike Hello. Tyndall, former student of Queen Elizabeth Grammar School and uh, famous for lots of different things which we'll explore. <laughs> so I'm really, really grateful for you to join us. I don't think I've actually seen you since you left school in the, in the flesh, as it were. I've seen you plenty of times around the place. Um, no, I know. A long time ago and lots has happened. Yeah, a long, long time ago. Yeah, it's slightly different. Slightly different now what? to where it was. Slightly different, indeed. No, I, I, so was, up there, you I left... was up there the other day, and, uh, but I because Trevor was retiring and I was trying to get down there on that Sunday that he retired, but unfortunately not. Oh, well, what a shame. Yeah, he is. He's retired. He's, he's gone. Um, he's going to have a little do next week. And then that's the end of a 40-year career at Quakes, yeah. if you can believe that. It's a good stint. Um, although mine is now challenging it. I'm in my 30th year, if you can believe right. that. You'll, you'll think, remember me arriving. Yeah, I think yeah, you, kept, you arrived when I was, it, it was, I was there. The maths teacher, the the ma the math teacher that gave me hope. The math teacher that gave you hope. Oh, that's nice to hear. Yeah, so you, I, as I have told people since, you were in my first ever... GCSE math set when I first started at Quegs, um, and, a, and a, a great group it was. Um, I met one of those guys uh, just the other week, actually, at the play, Chris Langrick, who I think you uh, ran into him at, uh, at a yeah. do at Christmas. Said, yeah, yeah, I did. Had a golf deal yeah, from him, yeah. So he was reminiscing, because um, he came to the bumped, career bumped, as well. I bumped into a few, actually. I saw Richard Alfway quite a bit last week, actually. I see him, Alec, uh -huh. Alec Goodair. Um, Alec Goodair. Ran, he was a, randomly bumped into James Mortimer at... Um, uh, at a rugby event at Twickenham, wow. at Twickenham. so yeah, you bump it, bump into a fair few of them. You met Jeff Tingle at um, at somewhere as well one day. Was it at Gloucester one day? Yeah, he sent me a picture yeah. of you saying hello. Yeah. So yeah, it's nice. It's nice to bump into people. I'm sure. <laughs> um, so the, the the purpose of what we do on a Wednesday afternoon um, is that we we have a chat with an old boy, and so thank you for joining us. Reflect on their lives and careers and, and journey to date look back a little bit of time at school and then you know words of wisdom for the for the current students and, and thinking about um anybody who fancies following your footsteps or even just you know people who, who want to come and listen and find out what um what our old students have been up to and i think you're number 23 in the series now the, the last one of season two so right. again really grateful for, you to, for joining it's been, it's been a and, great uh, series till now yeah <laughs> yeah, well, indeed. We'll we'll <laughs> I hope so. We'll so you you left school in 1997, um, and I I looked it up. You did A levels in PE, which was a relative new subject. Yeah. DT with Mr. Preston and Mr. Ben. Mr. Pre and Mr. You and my... Mr. Preston changed changed. He moved me, didn't he? If he hadn't moved me from back row, who who knows? Who knows? Well, indeed. In fact, it's uh, Mr. Ben claims credit for that oh, these days because Mr. Preston's retired. He, but Mr. Ben uh, always claims that he made you the player you are. Uh, yeah. Uh, that's one because <laughs> he moved you from the back row into the centre uh, in under fourteen rugby. Yeah, I saw actually saw John Preston not so long back. Uh, he came to watch one of the Did Good and Bad the Rugby live live tours. Yeah, and he me he messages me now every now and again. Yeah, he's a good man. Oh, lovely. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so, 
Can you remember, it's a long time ago, can you remember why those A-levels, what were they leading to uh, right. if it wasn't going to be a professional rugby career? Uh, what, what, what happened I, uh, back in the I day? I can't lie to you, I wasn't really sure. I, I, you know, I would say that it wasn't really my strength, my, my academics. I, did, I loved doing like DT and, and whittling and doing all sorts with, uh, with wood and, every, and everything else, but it was, I think it was more, a lot of the time it was the teachers. Obviously, John Preston had coached, coached us through that time and got on really well with him. Uh, mm -hmm. The human biology was, I always I always fancied doing something sport-related. sport, sport related. You know, Sports psychology was what I was going to go to Durham to do post uh, before I yeah. sort of got an opportunity in rugby. So it was all sort of steering down that way of, of heading to Durham to obviously still play rugby, but at the same time try and... I'm not sure what I'd have done if I'd have got a sports psychology degree because generally, degree. Through, well, that I've learned. Through, yeah, through, through <laughs> my life, I generally didn't agree with uh, sports psychologists in team sports. So, uh, <laughs> but yeah, if I was that guy, it would have been weird. But um, uh, yeah, I think it was the subjects that I enjoyed more than more than actually trying to pitch him yeah. for where I was going to go with a career. It was more what I enjoyed doing, and I think my friendship group was sort of always in there. So it was a bit more that way than than anything else. And I, I think that that is important to to pick the things you enjoy as well as as yeah. one of the things that might lead you down to a certain path. Um, as we've already said, you're in class four G, and and you're in my first GCC class. Mr. Ha Mr. Hamish Gibbs form. You remember Mr. Gibb as as another yeah. rugby coach and form tutor. Yeah, he's retired now. So a lot, a lot of the teachers, not everybody, um, a lot of the teachers <laughs> from those times have obviously moved on. Retired. Well, uh, it is Mr. Mason's it is still here. It is. It's a few. Yes. Mr. Mason is still here. Yeah. He was one of your form tutors, form tutors, I think. And we mentioned Mr. Yeah. Ben already, who was a rugby coach, yeah. and he's, he's still here as head of year. Um, so those guys are, are, are from the old days, as it were. Um, I'm, I think I'm the fifth longest service mem serving member of staff now. Um, you, you're, look, even, you're, even looking after, you're looking is. like that as well. <laughs> Hello. It, it's starting to show the lines, the lines and the... Uh, there's no hair. The hair's long, long gone. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, this is what happens to us, isn't it? That was, yeah, that was the same for me, though. I, I just chopped it off before I knew it was coming. <laughs> it's, it's safer to get out, isn't it? So, um, and then, so, we, you know, um, you mentioned sport was always important to you at school. We had the first and second times that the school went to Twickenham in your career here when you were playing in the first first 15. Tell us about your memories of, of going to Twickenham in the you know, Daily Mail Cup final in 95 and 96, I think. Yeah, uh, they weren't great memories because we got spanked both times by Colston. <laughs> I know. Um, and then <laughs> and I had to then join, uh, when I joined Bath, quite a lot of those Colston boys were at Bath as well, so it was double the pain. Really? But I remember, <laughs> I, I remember the, you know, the good, you start at Castle, the big week was like the semi-finals at Castlecroft and and we had uh -huh. we had such a good group, uh, you know. I the first time I was playing year year young with um, John Jolly was lad and Kieran Stead and all those boys, and we had a really good group, and that was probably our best year. Um, but yeah, it, it just didn't fall our way that day. You know, Colston's had a very good program at the time, and um, but the memories there and uh, dancing in the dancing in the change room afterwards simply the best tina turner was our song i think at the yes. time it was always the song <laughs> that was played at the, the rugby awards at the that. time um so yeah, it was good memories and uh, even though it hurt for a long time because we thought we were better than that um i think actually the year that hurt the most was when our final year when we, we lost to uh we lost to durham in the quarterfinals at home uh, yeah. lee, lee best was playing in that team because uh, that was the year where we really thought we had a great team and we'd go, we'd go and win it. And I think that one, that one hurt the most. At least, at least we got to experience the Twickenham turf and, and, and have that environment to play in, which was quite special. Absolutely. And, and Quags has been back several times, well, yeah. many times since and, yeah. and um, won it on occasion. Yeah, it's hard to do, but they've, they've done it. It is. Um, yeah. And then they asked me to do a video last year and then they got, they got, they didn't do too well. They didn't quite go their way in the final. I was no, like, they, maybe they had a great run. Yeah, maybe never ask me to do a video ever again. <laughs> of support. No, they, they were. It was very inspiring. It was very kind of you to do it. And it, and to be fair, they were they were in it for a while, but they, they ran out of steam and, and the the team ended up too strong. But they, they had a great run, and it and it was it was the making a lot of those those boys actually yeah. in terms of just you know who they've become as people. I think it it was a it was a fantastic experience. You know, one you had as well, um, albeit a few years earlier. And um, so in 1997, I think I'm right in saying, 
it was when rugby turned professional. It was, it was the same time. Yeah, so, it, was the, uh, it was basically the year. It was basically the year after. I think it, 95, 96 was that first year. But it was then the first year they really started looking to recruit people from the school, mm. the school's age group. And um, yeah, I, I know schoolboy rugby has changed a little bit now. Whereas it was all, it was sort of the be all and end all at, at school back back in time. Whereas there's multiple ways of getting found into a Premiership club nowadays. You know, through your clubs, local clubs, which I didn't really play. I, you know, Sandal was close to me, but you know, we played rugby on a Saturday, and I didn't really want to play rugby again on a Sunday. Whereas a lot, mm-hmm. a lot, a lot of lads did. Um, so yeah, yeah we, once I you know. Actually, go, another guy I give a lot of credit to is um, uh, Jeff Whoppet, who was head coach at Bradford, mm-hmm. Bradford Grammar School, but happened to also be the England under 18 schoolboys coach. Um, and, you know, he gave me a lot of opportunities because I played for Yorkshire and then I went to the North trial and I didn't get picked for the North. Had a good game, but Bol- actually, my best friend, Bolsh, he rinsed me. He rounded me. <laughs> I, I was playing out of position at fullback and he absolutely skinned me. Um, uh, so yeah, I didn't get picked off the back of it, but Jeff Wappet liked me, so he got me a game for for it was the Midwest uh, Midlands versus the Southwest. I think I played for mm-hmm. the South the Southwest and scored a couple of tries, which got me an England trial off the back of it. And again, I didn't get picked for it, uh, the England 18s group, but Jeff Wappet kept me around. And um, and then Tom May, Tom May went on a study group, an A level study group, uh, missed two of the Five Nations as it was then. And I got two starts and scored four tries and fortunately stayed in there. And we went on this great schoolboy tour in 97 um, to Australia where we had the likes of, you know, that team had Johnny Wilkinson in it, Ian Ian Bolshaw, Andrew Sheridan, Steve Borthwick, Lee Mears, Dave Flatman, uh, Simon Daniele. Um, They had a lot of internationals that that went on to be full-time internationals and and pretty much most of that team got picked up off the back of it into the academies and you know uh, four of us ended up at Bath and and then you know Dave Flatman and that ended up at Sarah's Wilco was at Newcastle and um but it gave us that nice leg up to go into to go into a club and so I deferred my uni for a year to because Bath, I got offered stuff from Newcastle as well and from mm. from Worcester. Was there rugby league somewhere uh, as well? Was, was r- r- rugby league was before that. That was like uh, at the end of my GCSEs. They, oh, okay. it was to go I to half the, a memory of, of there being <coughs> some scouting going on. At that yeah, there, well, there was two bits. There was uh, uh, under 15s. St. H- we used to play. I think it's, it's called Cowdery School. Uh, is over the, and yeah, they had yeah. a few rugby league boys playing and. We played them in one of the, I think, whether it was Daily Mail or, and St. Helens off the back of it, which asked if I was interested in going and looking at their academy system. So 15, their YTS program, as it was probably uh, then. Yeah. Um, and I was like, well, no, it was completely out of my comfort zone at that point. I, would, I was quite happy to stay uh, stay in my comfort zone. And then the other time it was talked about was when Jason Robinson came across to yeah. England in 2001 or whatever. And they, uh, rugby league, were quite annoyed that they lost. And as I, you can understand, the were star. annoyed that the yeah. star, star's gone, and they were trying to look at pulling someone back. Um, and my name was thrown around. Nothing ever came of it, but um, it was there. I, I just started playing for England. I was, uh, I was like, I'm not going to go and try and dab my toe in a completely different sport when I've just sort of got to where I want to go <laughs> this one. So yeah. yeah. Going in the right direction, yeah. and you were at Bath, and Clive Woodward was at Bath at that stage. Is that uh, right? He sort of left just as I came in, and Andy Robinson Is took over because he got his he got the England job in '97, so he was the coach. So when he signed the right. contract, but then by the time we got down there off the back of the the tour, Andy Robinson had sort of come in, and he and Clive had gone off to uh, to be uh, the new England coach. So yeah, Robbo was thrown in at the deep end. And he was involved with Colston's back in the yeah. day, so it's yeah, yeah, a, yeah. a team to remember, well, yeah. So the second team coach is Alan Martinovich, who was the coach at, Colst- ah, yeah. at Colston. So Colston's was sort of a, a, a feeder school into Bath rugby because they had such yeah. a good programme. And Alan Martinovich was a second team coach, yeah. Um, wow. So, yeah, yeah it, it, you know, it's it's all quite strange how it all it all worked out. Yeah. How it all was connected up. So you, I think you made your debut for England. I don't know when you made your debut for England because you don't know this. On uh, it was in February two thousand. But the only time I've ever been to an international at Twickenham, I was in a box 
hosted by an old boy in the school, and I got to watch your debut against Ireland in February 2000, which was amazing. Yeah. It was just a pure fluky thing. I got a phone call on a Friday night and said, do you want to go to Twickenham? I went, do I? So it, it worked brilliantly. Um, so I was, I was able to see you score, you try and, yeah. you know, select quite a different result that day to, to last it, weekend. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> um, I mean, it, was a, you know, things of... it was it was a bit of a journey because I, you know, I got, I'd, I'd gone into the world, uh, into the World Cup squad in 99. So I trained with the 99 squad. So I'd had a bit of exposure to the standards yeah. that you were expecting and what Clive was doing and everything like that. But I missed out on actually getting in the 99 World Cup team. Um, you know, because you still had the, the, the Glanvilles, Jerry Guska, Jerry retired in the middle of that tournament, which is why I got called up. Mm -hmm. Mike Cat was still in there. Um, mm -hmm. So you had all those players, um, but it was nice to have had that little sort of taste of it. And then 2000 rolls around. Obviously, we we were knocked out in the quarterfinals of the, that 99 World Cup. So a few guys retired, your Ben Clark, Victor Bogus, Jerry, you know, Phil the Glanville was sort of, you know, stopping playing international rugby, John Collard. So it was a nice mix of the hardened guys from who were in the middle of their playing career. And then we managed to bring in the likes of Benny Cohen. Well, over the next couple of years, Benny Cohen, myself, Steve Thompson, Ben Kay, um, Ian Bolshaw, you know, Sinbad danced around there for a bit. So there was like a an influx of, of players that sort of then helped kick that team on. So then that team did kick on and... You know, a few years later, you're, it's a World Cup again. I mean, I, I think we'd all love to hear your particular perspective on on that whole experience. We've we've all read things about it. Remember watching it. Um, weirdly, I was talking to Year 13s last year. Last year, I think it was about the World Cup. Of course, it struck me they'd never been born at this point, so I had to explain all about it. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's a long time ago now. Yeah. But but you know, please can you tell us about that whole that whole build up and that whole experience? Because you know, that's a big. A big thing in anyone's career to have to have gone to Australia and won the World Cup. So, yeah, I mean, look, it was. Um, Can you remember? It, well, it, it, I don't. Oh, I don't ever just define it as the the World Cup because you know England at that point it, it was a three year build up to it. You know, the I say the the drawing the line in the sand of ninety nine and then the importance of the tour in two. Well, obviously we lost a few Grand Slams on the way as well. Uh, we lost in two thousand yeah. to Scotland and then two thousand and one. But we beat the 2000 tour to, uh, to South Africa, I always say, was, was one of the most important things because mm. we lost the first game and it was, the, it was the first TMO decision used in a game, I think, I think. And, oh, and, wow. and Tim Stimson's try was disallowed. Um, the TMO was also South African, so funnily enough, we did. it, <laughs> it, didn't, allow a, <laughs> it didn't allow a try that might have won them the game. Um, but I remember how and annoyed and angry we were after that game and Laura, I still remember uh, Delalio walking off the field saying there's no chance we're losing next week and um, and we didn't we went we went out the next week and we won and that was the first time we'd won down there for uh, God knows how long and it just changed everyone's mentality in the fact that we've gone to South Africa and then beaten them and from that point on I didn't lose to the Southern Hemisphere team so I'd never lost going into the World Cup. I'd never lost to New Zealand, never lost to Australia, and only lost once to South Africa. And yes, we'd lost the Grand Slams that we talk about. Obviously, we lost in two thousand and two to France, and then we roll into two thousand and three. And yeah, the way you build it up, we were watching that two thousand and three tournament last uh, for the for the podcast as a, re, a sort of a throwback yeah. 20, 20 year throwback. And you know, we we used the most players we've ever used, and definitely the most players Clive had ever used in a, in a tournament and you know it started off I didn't play the first two games you know Char Charlie Hodgson played uh, Phil Christophers who kept me out of he kept me out of 18 schoolboys stuff as well he played for the North he was in there Sinbad was in there so it's a really different team and then it gradually progressed back to what people would remember as that the team mm -hmm. obviously we went to Ireland it all started there with the, the standing on the wrong side and not Jono, Jono not moving, and that whole <laughs> sort of scenario of, and and then we got that uh, uh, an incredible victory there. Today, so we went to that World Cup knowing that we should win it. I mean, that yeah. sounds a bit a bit on the confident side, but we were we'd been number one team in the world for three years, so we knew we should win it, and yeah. um, 
and, and, and we probably didn't play the best rugby in that World Cup because I think because of that point, it was more that we didn't want to lose it rather than going out there and, and doing what we'd done in, especially if you look at the games in the summer where we beat New Zealand in Wellington with, and we went down to 13 men at one point and then we smashed Australia uh, in Melbourne the following week. And uh, it was just, it's a, it's, I always think it's funny because I was 24 um, you don't expect to be going to a World Cup at 24 with a with a great chance of winning it, and I uh, still, you know, if you compared my memories probably to Martin Johnson's, you know, when he wins it and he knows that's his last tournament, it's the last game he's going to play, and he said, you know, you know, he spent a, most pretty much all the night walking around Sydney. He didn't, you know, didn't go to bed, but he didn't really go and go out boozing and everything else. Where I was, mm-hmm. I was 24, just turned 25 in the South Africa game. I was. Yeah, obviously I was going out celebrating. So, um, but the memories, <laughs> you know, the, the sort of memories of that tournament were were great. You know, we spent about eighteen days in Perth at the start of it because we had our first three games up there, I think it was, and uh, uh-huh. before before we ended up uh, before we moved to go, I can't remember where we played Samoa. Um, but we, before we started heading down, we played our quarter final against Wales in the uh, SunCorp. Uh, which we didn't play very well, and we scraped through that. Really, you know, losing yeah. losing at yeah. losing at half time. You know, Wales had played unbelievably well in their last match against New Zealand. We were like, oh my god, we're going to end up playing New Zealand in the quarter final. Um, and then and, and then yeah, on to Sydney and and the front they got dropped for the France game, which was a, an incredibly wise decision from Clive because I went out and met my wife in a bar that night. So. The day that, <laughs> I was going to ask you about that. Yeah, yeah. The, 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 that that's true, is it? That's the sort of legend. That is that is actually yeah, that, true. That, that's what happened. That is yeah. true. that is true. Unfortunately, Austin Healy tries to take a lot of credit for it, which uh, isn't actually correct. But he was. We went uh, myself and Coza because uh, Richard Hill came back in, I believe. So and myself and Coza wanted to go out for a beer because we were both annoyed about being dropped. And yeah, we mm-hmm. went to a bar called the Manly Wharf Bar, and and Zara was in there having uh, drinks with some friends and. Cosa and Austin had met her before, uh, so yeah, they they I prefer giving Cosa credit. So they uh, they 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 sort of introduced me, and then yeah, we became mates, and it went from there. Yeah, and then excellent, and then the you final, got picked into the final uh, yeah, again. Yeah, 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 you got Cl- yeah. Cl- I mean, Clive always said that this was always his plan, which is always it's always good when it works, isn't it? Um, that he <laughs> was always uh, it, if if he said he put me back in to t- uh, to sort of face off against. Sterling Mortlock. So I wonder whether he'd have done the same thing if New Zealand had beaten Australia. But you know, Sterling Mortlock mm. basically won. You know, he he was incredible against New Zealand. So um, it was always going to be a big challenge. You know, their home stadium. First five minutes, they put that crossfield kick in. Lottie Takiri gets up and scores, and then you're like sort of on your back foot. But one thing, mm. one thing that team had learned to do was know how to win in whatever the situation. You know, if yeah. if we got ahead, very rarely would we lose a game. Now, there was only one possible comeback that I can I can remember, and that was an autumn test against New Zealand where they started making the runners at the end. But every, normally, you know, we we put so much pressure on them. We'd go three, six, nine, twelve. Johnny would just knock over thing, and we'd just keep the store, court, uh, scoreboard ticking over. Um, and it was so hard to get back in. But you know that that final. Uh, we never really got a foothold in. We missed opportunities. Ben K, you know, dropped that ball early yeah. on, and you know, to give us that what we were used to doing, building those leads. So Australia were always in it, and then you know, I think um, Elton Flatley's kick to to draw it. You never want someone to miss uh, a kick to lose a game. You always want someone to kick it to win a game. And yeah. um, Elton Flatley, the you know, forty out from that scrum penalty was, uh, uh, you know. I think it was. I think it was a lovely thing about rugby is you know half the front row went over and sort of tapped him on the arse and said, "Fair play, mate." Because you know if he'd have missed it, he would have been. It would have been him who'd yeah. blame. But no one wants to. Yeah, no one. No one wants to see someone do that. Um, you know they prefer to yeah. see Johnny do a drop goal to win it. I mean he, Johnny had missed four in that game, so and three on his <laughs> three on his good foot. So he swapped to his bad foot and took took that to win it. But, but, <laughs> Um, and we should have just done that earlier, shouldn't we? Um, yeah, uh, but yeah, it was just, it was fantastic. It was perfect, perfectly set up for Wilco as well. It was, it was, it was absolutely wonderful. You know, even all these years later, I can still, uh, and I'm sure, you know, 
everybody can still still see those final moments, see that last bit. It's, it's etched in the memory, isn't but that, it? But that, so do you watch it? Have you watched it back? Uh, do you watch it back? Or do you, no, I do, I, how how easy I, is it to watch things back? I would you? say I haven't watched. Uh, I haven't watched that back for until about four years ago, maybe. Um, really? Because we're wow. doing something. Yeah, I just, yeah. I don't really watch old games back. I have since I've retired. Mm. Since I've retired, I've probably watched more. Uh, of the old games back, but not, but not load, not in full either. Um, which wow. is weird. It, which is weird. It's just yeah, I just ha haven't done it. And then and I've, heard, I've heard other people say that it's it's not yeah. something that you do yeah. necessarily. You, you sort of never um, never looking back. You you because now as well back then you didn't review to the same extent as what you do. You know when I finished in 2014, the review of your yeah. game is. Is, was quite relentless. You you go through every carry, every pass, every uh, to see if you can win. But whereas back in O three, it was very general around what your attacking game were was. I mean, Clive brought in this thing. We had um, it was I can't remember what it was called Pro Sport, where there was there was God knows how many cameras yeah. around Twickenham that just fought, and you were like draft pieces moving on the board, so everyone knew where you were all the time. But obviously, being in Australia, we didn't have that, so the review stuff was was limited to. Just probably attack, defense, um, and then exit. All. So yeah, it, it, you didn't really get into it as much as as you do now. Whereas, so yeah, I've watched a couple back, but I wouldn't say I've watched a lot of the games that I've ever played back. No, it's really interesting. And and you make the point there, because Clive Clive Woodward started that. But technology has has you know infiltrated sport at all yeah. levels now in terms of that, that kind of analysis. And that's I guess that's a good thing in many ways, and it's it's changed. Things. Other ways, you know, it's that it's that um, margins and you know yeah, yeah. the tiny incremental changes that can be brought in, and you know, not just rugby. It's it's all professional sport, isn't it? I mean, that will have started to happen through through the rest of your career, I guess. You'll have seen that evolve. Yeah, I mean, Clive Clive started that. You know, he 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 was still one of the best or one of the most innovative coaches that you know, through my career that I'd, I'd seen, you mm -hmm. know, I know that Stuart Lancaster, but I had stopped playing for England by that point. He was going off on looking at other sports and, but Clive, you know, with, with the glasses that blacked out. So you were trying to follow, trying to learn how to follow balls when you couldn't see, you know, I mean, a few, a few props got smashed in the face. I'm not going to lie by the ball when they, <laughs> at the wrong time, but, um, you know, he, you know, the tight shirts was Clive's, well, with Jason yeah. Robinson's idea, but Clive sort of pushed it forward um, you know, we did, Robinson's idea, really? yeah. I think the story goes that Jason uh went to Clive after one game, and Jason had been scrag tackled like four times in that game because we had those mm. massive shirts that hung out, big yeah. jerseys. Yeah. And he was like, "If that guy doesn't get me, the fullback is not is not tackling me because he backs himself one on one as as Jason Robinson should do." But um mm. and he's like, "Well, that's." potentially I could have scored a hat trick at the weekend and I think Clive went away and did a bit more research about how many scrag tackles there were because of people just being able to grab the back of jerseys that wouldn't have been able to make a tackle and he and he was like yeah actually I think we need to change this and then spoke to Nike about it and, and they worked together and, uh, wow. and unfortunately because Nike sponsored quite a few teams you can't make it completely your own <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> it, yeah South Africa in a very, were in a very similar kit as well as France so uh, but yeah, it, yeah. Uh, you know, that's you know, they're the sort of things that he was always trying to do. Clive was all, he didn't always get it right, but he had a he had a strong set of player, a trusted senior player group that if they said that we're not doing that, he he yeah. he sort of went okay. I won't. I'll go find something else. And yeah, you know, all our yeah. all our S and C stuff was uh, was set on not on rugby. It was set on who was the best in the world at any other sport at this certain exercise and you know the fitness levels and Dave Redding and what he did when he. You know, came in. You know, having a fitness guy who'd walk onto the field in the middle middle of a session, go right, we're off the field. That's enough time. We're done. We've covered it. You know, and now you look at it now. It's all measured in meters. You've all got tracking devices in your shirts. You've got heart rates on. They know how long you've been working in one zone, so they can go right. You're done. You've you've hit your numbers. You're off. Um, so mm -hmm. it's uh, yeah, the shift has been uh, seismic for sure. Since when I started, anyway. But when, when yeah. I started, it was basically semi-pro. We trained once a day, and we spent quite a bit of time in the pub. So, um, <laughs> good old days. They yeah, were, they were the good old days. Yeah, it's definitely moved on from that. Um, if just thinking about that, if you if you were giving advice to to someone starting out today, someone who who wants to make it, obviously 
we always say as teachers, you know, we make that teeth sucking noise. Oh, it's quite difficult. You know, yeah. that will have happened to you, I'm sure. Because it's, it's a thing. It's, it's a pyramid. It's, it's hard to get through. But, you know, what advice would you give to someone who's dead set? Because we have them still. And, and year yeah. on year, there are boys who've got a chance. It all, de it all depends on age. I, I, it comes down to parents as well, I think. I think mm. parent, parents don't put too much pressure on. Yeah. At the end of the day, if you, want to, if you want to get better at something, you've got to enjoy it. Because if you, yeah. if you enjoy it, you will then... Uh, you will nurture your your need to get better at it and understand why you're not as good at it or what areas you need to work on. You need to be very honest with yourself and, and be ha mm. know what your flaws are and work on that. But it all comes down to, I would say, to enjoyment first until you get to a certain point, which is, you know, those 15, 16 now, I would say, where you then need to be looking at are you putting in the, are you training in the right way and, and everything else and your, your skill sets. And that's where you become a bit, you can say you become a bit more serious about what you do. You've still got to have fun. You've still got to enjoy um, spending your time with your mates and having a laugh because that is, that's the intoxicating thing about rugby that keeps you coming back is the, the connections you make with the people you play with. Um, and then as you go forward, I think there's a lot, I think there's enough pressure on kids already. Like, do you play for your school? Do you play for your club? Do you, who, you know, who pulls in the time? Because, you know, you never ask a, uh, a professional player to play two games in a week yet some kids can be playing three games in a week and I don't yeah. necessarily believe that that's the right way of doing it I think the kids should whoever it is should enjoy playing for the team that they're playing play for the team that you enjoy playing for the most uh, or if a game's more important one week you've got to find that balance um, yeah. yeah and then it's just it <laughs> always comes down to hard work and you know the unseen the boring stuff the, uh, the non-coachable stuff work rate um ability to pull your mates off the floor that sort of hard graph stuff stuff you can't teach it's in certain you if you've got that you've always got a good base to, to do it rather than you know everyone will know a guy who had so much talent but then didn't get get to make it because someone was prepared to probably work harder than them. so yeah if you don't if you're not prepared to graph that's the that's where it gets to the sort of business end where you've got to but you've got to do that in the right way, you know. Doesn't don't become selfish about it. You've still got to um, do it in the right way. Yeah, you're part of the team. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's interesting you said before about the the opportunities when they come. You've got to grab them because yeah. you know, on on the one hand, it looks like it's not happening, and all of a sudden it does. You've got to be ready. Yeah, for, you got, you got, you got, yeah. You've got to have the ability to recognise it. But that's a lot of time that might come down to parents as well. Going, look, this, he's giving you an opportunity now. Uh, yes, it puts a bit more pressure on, but. You know, if you're ready to take that, you'll you'll take it, and and that and that's what you've got to do. You've always got to chase those opportunities. That's what I'd say. You know, don't get also don't live in a comfort zone. Chase opportunities that pushes your boundaries, because then you, you'll you'll find out you'll find out more about yourself. You'll find out more about where your game's at. You know, I always, I put it into a sporting thing with like when we own Mumbai Dude, our racehorse. You know, from a different mm. point of view, the way that the three lads who owned it, three sports lads, we sort of dictated to the trainer where it, it was going to go. Well, not dictated, but um, yeah. we won at one level and we said, right, let's go to the next level. And then a trainer being, he was quite a young trainer, Mickey Joe at the time, was like, well, let's consolidate at this level. We're like, well, no, we've won at that level. Let's go to that level. And he came along for that, that sort of ride as well because we just wanted to go, well, we've won there. We don't need, let's go there, let's go there. Probably, Let's push it. Yeah, and you know, he ended up doing what he did because you know he liked looking at another horse in the race and digging in and, and wanting to win. And you know, he wasn't he wasn't the most talented horses, but the fact that he wanted to race was was a, a good thing to have. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That I mean, that's really really interesting and, and and brilliant advice for for youngsters and 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 aspiring players in all sports. Actually, not just rugby. Yeah. I, 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 that applies, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, so, you, you you mentioned it earlier. You met your wife to be um, <laughs> yeah. in Sydney, and you know, time goes by. So, tell us as much or as little as you want. But what's it like to be a member of the royal family? Um, <laughs> yeah, it's. Uh, I think Dave Flat Dave Flatman summed it quite well in my uh, uh, at the wedding as he was our MC and he was like from Wakefield to Windsor. Um, so, uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it was. I think I I always say it wasn't wasn't as much of a sort of shock as uh, as some might think it 
like me because you know at the time mm. uh, Prince Harry and Prince William were massive England fans all the way sort of through our careers. So I've met him numerous times. Then yeah. having been out with with both of them, met I'd met Princess Eugenie and Princess Beatrice. Uh, obviously Zara's mum is patron of uh, Scottish rugby, so I'd met her at rugby enough times. So through the eight years that uh, we've been going out, uh, you know, I'd got to meet a majority of the family and, and got to know and, and had the the pleasure of meeting the Queen on numerous occasions. So it was a good sort of trickle in, in, into integration into it in the fact that, you know, by the time that we, we got married, you sort of knew where you, you stood. And, um, but they've been brilliant. I mean, they've always been brilliant to me. Um, they've always sort of welcomed me and the Queen was amazing she always knew what was going on she was always so well briefed you know if I was injured she knew I was injured I was like how do you know that I'm injured and then you just think someone, <laughs> someone makes sure she knows so um, oh gosh, that was yeah, yeah. And, and I always checked how you, how you were doing how England were going always played you know she was always interested in how the team was going and how everything was looking moving forward because after sort of 2003 going if you think about it, uh, 04 to, you know, yes, we had a World Cup final in 07, but that sort of period, 04 to 09, 010, was, was, was tough, really, for England. We were get, went through a bit of, a, yeah. bit of a slump post that 2003 World Cup. So, um, yeah, it was, uh, it, you know, they, they were always great. And um, it's, it's always a bit of one of those, you know, yeah, of the you know, the Queen's funeral, you sort of think when you where you end up sitting, you're mm. like, why why am I here? <laughs> it's, mm. it's like one of those, yeah. and I'm sure it'll be the same at the at the sort of coronation. But you know, I'm quite laid back, so just sit back and enjoy it, and, and yeah, go go with what's happening. And, uh, yeah, uh, don't overthink these things. Uh, yeah, get I'm, on with I'm it. I'm the hugger. <laughs> you're just getting a hug, whatever. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I always give them a hug. <laughs> That's the secret. Get, get, start with the hug and, and, yeah. and build on. From... The Queen visited school in your time yeah, in 92. Yeah. Do you remember that happening? I we, do. Where were you? I, I've talked to a few boys I, about that. I've got a feeling I was in a science lesson of some description, uh-huh. but I can't be sure. I've got, I, that's my picture that I have in my, in my head, uh, which came into our classroom that we were in. Um, I do sort of tell a story that I, I happened to meet her and I told her I'd be in the family in the, in the near future, but um, obviously I'll make that up. I didn't actually say that. Would have been very, would have been very good foresight if I had. But uh, um, yeah. yeah, so I do remember that. I, I tell you what I do remember is is like being in, like being on break and then looking around and looking at all the the rooftops and how many police were on each of the rooftops. Um, yeah. uh, that's, Snipers on the yeah, rooftops, yeah, that's, as I've heard that's, people that's, describe. Yeah. Yeah, that's, what I, uh, that's what I remember about it. Um, I don't really remember much else apart from the classroom and then yeah, looking around at all the police that are on the rooftops, yeah. So that was the first time you met the Queen. As you say, you met, you met her numerous times thereafter. And um, I don't know, if, you won't know, you may not know, we, Trevor and I got invited to take part in a documentary about you and Zara um, oh, in lockdown. Oh, and because, because this is a Channel 5 thing. You've probably never seen it. I don't know if you watch things about yourself. You, you Try, don't not rugby, so Try not to. You probably don't watch documentaries either. But that was really interesting because they did all that remotely and, and cut it together. And we were, you know, it was a, it was a really nice programme. I've never been invo- I've never been interviewed on TV or anything like that. You want to you say the right thing and say nice things. I don't want it to be some kind of hatchet job where they, <laughs> where they cut it together and, and make it all appear... Yeah, the, dubious, but it was, it, the worst, it was a very nice the worst student ever. <laughs> I said really good things. Yeah, he was. A, he, was a, he was. He tried really hard, and uh, he, uh, you mentioned you know you did find academic academic life more challenging. I remember a parents' evening, probably you know getting on for thirty years ago, where you know you're working hard, and we had a good chat with mum and dad, and you know how can we help him because he's 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 finding life a, a bit more challenging at the moment, and. And and that was a good conversation to have because it was, I think, um, I think some, history sometimes was my, you worked history hard but was found my it. Nemesis. History was, was my it? nemesis. But I spent, uh, who was my history teacher? Um, oh, who was the history back in the day? So you had, you had uh, Mr. Binney, Mr. Seal. It must, um, but it might have been Mr. Binney, actually. But he spent so yeah, much. Still, yeah. So when I was doing my GCSE history, like, I, I was predicted horrendous grades. In all fairness, he spent a, so much time with me and actually got... It wasn't about the fact that my knowledge was bad. It was the, the way that I just didn't 
answer the question in the way the question was asking me to write it or whatever. Like if it said two, three comparisons, I'd write two two pages and I'll, and he's like, well, you haven't described three comparisons. So <laughs> yeah, there's a lot about actually learning how to write the answers rather than anything else. But yeah, it was, uh, it was still a challenge. Still a challenge for students today, as, as it will continue yeah. to be, I'm sure. Yeah, and sure. Um, so, so you you mentioned your wedding. You got married in 2011, yeah. I think, yeah. right? Um, a, a big a big wedding <laughs> in in Scotland. A, 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 a slightly big wedding, yeah. With, with 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 everybody there, basically, that was yeah. I, that was how it happened. Yeah, I think, yeah, but then I think that's the that's the uniqueness of sport. Is even with Zara's sport, it, you know, they are. I think with someone like her sport, it's so dangerous. So it can be so dangerous. Mm-hmm. And there have been so many, um, unfortunately, bad accidents that when, even though it's an individual sport where you're driven to succeed on your own, when they get off the horse, they're best mates off the bit yeah. because they respect what each of them has to go through, you know, especially on cross country day. Um, mm-hmm. So you have, so we, I had, I'd played for Bath, I'd played for Gloucester and obviously England. So you've got three groups of, you know, at that, at that, mates. Yeah, at that point, 14 years worth of mates, uh, plus your, your England side. So you had a lot of people, yeah. So it ended up being quite, quite, a, few, quite a few people there, but um, it was an exceptional wedding, I have to say. <laughs> it was, was a, good, a lot of Big people. Day. I don't think you find anyone, anyone who went who didn't have a, a, a fun Saturday night. That's for them. I can imagine. Um, and then, you know, we've got, you've, you've started a family, you've you've moved into other things, because you retired, when when exactly did you retire? I, was, cause you, I you retired, coaching as well. Yeah, I retired 2014. So I, I, I had, obviously, the 2011 uh, World Cup had its, its, own, <laughs> its own failings, uh, mainly from the players' point of view. And, you know, sort of came back off the back of that. And um, I had met Stuart Lancaster. He was the new coach. He was going, mm-hmm. he he would coach the under 20, uh, I think they're 21s at that point, but now they're 20s. And he was like, he wanted to bring through this young crop of players to play. Um, he's, he's from Wakefield, isn't he? Is that yeah, right? I think. He's yeah, from yeah, he's from around here. Yeah, he's from Leeds or, or I'm yeah. not sure where, I don't remember where he was born, but. Yeah, not not. Have I got it right? Is, he thought at Kettle Fork, was that yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, actually, that could be right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And yeah, obviously, Amazing. obviously, school teacher, and he came. And I've got, I give him a load of credit because he he drove down to my house and came and saw me. And I said, look, I don't really want to finish on my England career on the way that it might, the way yeah. that you're now saying with with that World Cup being the last thing I did. And he's like, well, I I want to go with young players. I'm going to give you. I wanted you to know just in case you wanted to retire or anything like that. And I said, well, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to retire from international rugby. Why would I if I'm still going to be playing? Because I'll always want to play for my country if I'm playing well enough and I can get picked. So, you know, a lot, a few people retired when he had that conversation with him. Whereas I was like, well, no, I won't retire. I mean, I'd play, I'd play for my country at 45 if I was good enough, and they thought I could do. Um, So, and also at the end that year my contract was running out in Gloucester and, and it sort of got to a point where uh, I didn't really uh, get that sorted with Gloucester very quickly so at the end of 2011 I sort of didn't have a didn't have a so end of 20, uh, 2011 2012 season I didn't really have a contract but then uh, Brian Redpath left and um, Nigel Davis came in and and he sort of understood what Gloucester was and uh, he what he knew he needed people who knew what it meant to play for Gloucester and uh, those old school players around and he wanted me to get back and I played for the Barbarians and off the back of the Barbarians and three games in a week which I've just told you you shouldn't do but I, I did it for the <laughs> Barbarians but um, he uh, he offered me a he offered me sort of a coaching and playing gig and so I, I was like well I don't really have anything else at the moment so I, I took it. And we ended up doing a couple of years at, at, at that. And then at the end of that 2013-2014 tw- that, uh, season, I still wanted to play. Nigel wanted me to be a full-time coach because I played, uh, since that World Cup, I played some of my best, uh, my most enjoyable rugby, whether people t- agree, I felt I played some of my best stuff because I was just focusing on Gloucester. And, mm. um, and I still wanted to do the sort of same thing again because I was – Nine years at Gloucester, I would love to have got to 10. I had 190 
won games or something for Gloucester. I could have got to 200, which is always a great landmark. So there's loads of little individual things for me that would be nice. Um, but it sort of wasn't really working itself out because I was holding out from Nigel. And then, anyway, we played at Worcester last game of the season. We finished, We lost. Uh, we had so many injuries that second year. And uh, Nigel, off the back of it, we slipped into ninth, which in Nigel's contract meant that they could get, they could I think it meant they could get rid of him. So yeah, then he got he got the sack, which I immediately knew meant that I wasn't I wasn't going to be there next year because you bring in a new coach. Or yeah. You have to bring yeah. in your own coaching staff because if you take on historical coaches, then if it doesn't go right, you can't blame you haven't made all the <laughs> you you know you haven't made yeah. all the, oh sorry you haven't made all the decisions on your own. Um, so yeah, so. Uh, I, I then thought, right, I'll have a year away from rugby and see if I want to. If coaching is a passion, then I'll want to get. You'll miss I'll, it. I'll but... miss it, and I want to get back to it. And then you know, I sort of went away and started doing other stuff. And you know, it's a coaching is a hard job that doesn't pay very well. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you know, when I sort of went away and started doing other stuff, I was like, no, I, well, I, I'm not missing it enough to want to go back to it. I still like watching the game, like breaking it down, which we get to do with the podcast in a bit. And, and a few other things that I do, yep. um, but to then have the drive to go back and and do it in, in, as a full time job, it's it wasn't really there. So yeah, so, so we moved on, and you moved on, and you started to do other things. And you know, the podcast one of the things you mentioned. But what what were the initial things that you you because you've got time, you're not playing rugby anymore. What what do you, you know? What, well, can you remember that time? What it, do I want to do next? Yeah, you know, you're a young man, but. Um, I guess that's true for a lot of sportsmen is, you know, if you don't stay in the game or you don't move to coaching or some other aspect, I mean, you, you're around the game and obviously you, you, the podcast is through the game, but what, what sort of, what drives, what, what's coming next? What, what thoughts did you have at that time about, about um, where you wanted yeah, to go? Look, it's really, diffi- it's really difficult to, uh, to sort of put it into value when you, um, so I did 17 years and, mm-hmm. and to then, uh, basically, Basically, wake up one morning and my schedule is no longer my schedule. So my routine is gone. You're 35. Mm. You thought 35 mates have gone, um, and you've you know you go through this whole period of not really knowing where you're going. I haven't at that point. Also, I hadn't really thought about retiring, so I hadn't really prepped myself. I've had, I, I had I fortunately had a a very good career to have as in your CV and. And mm. obviously, with marrying Zara, you are a, a public interest anyway. So, I had a sure. I had a couple of sort of sponsorship deals that uh, continued on and and continued on for a long time. So you had a little bit, you had a safety net, but still, when you've sort of had a purpose for a, a mass amount of time, and then you wake up actually, you don't really have a purpose. It it was it was weird. It was really weird. Mm, and, I bet it was. And you know, I, and. I say it wasn't easy. I think if you asked Sarah, she said it would have been hard for her because she was sort of, I was a different, um, whether I'd say I was a different person, but it wasn't the same because you, you, haven't, re- yeah. you haven't figured out what, you, what, you are, what you're doing, who is the new you or, or what is the new what thing. The next chapter. Yeah, what, what, yeah, what's going to define you um, for the future. And, and, it, and it has been weird and it's been, it's taken me all over the place. And, you know, I think I would even say now uh eight years on i still wouldn't really define the, that i've got it on lockdown you know <laughs> it's uh yeah. it's a it's an amalgamation of Evolving. many yeah many things that that you try and pull, t- pull together because all I, I still sometimes sit back and say all i like is a nice schedule that i've that i understand and is the same all the time um, cr- yeah. i think yeah. i think I'm, you know, whether rugby's turned me into that or whether i always have been a creature of habit of needing routine um so when I don't, and it bounces around, and it, it's all dates are all over the place, and you know this and that, it it's uh, yeah, it's it, it annoys me sometimes, but uh, yeah. it can also be yeah. it can also be a lot of fun, and it takes you places that you didn't think you'd go, and um, but yeah, yeah, I think we, I think I'm slowly on my way to getting to where I might have a bit more <laughs> of a structured thing than that, but yeah, I, I always ask everyone this: what. What's you know what's next? What what sort of um, have you got any unfulfilled ambitions? Have you got things that you still want to do that that you haven't got round to yet, or that that you've decided uh, in the future? I mean, obviously you've got children, and 
Happy birthday to Lucas yeah. yesterday, is that right? Yesterday, yeah. Yeah. Two yesterday. Yeah. Two? He's two now, of course. Yeah, wow. two yesterday. So, yeah, I don't know where that two's gone. Right. As someone someone said on the group the other day, they said to the wife that two years ago you were on the bathroom floor. And I was like, yeah, that is, it seems doesn't seem like yesterday. But, uh, um, yeah, I, is there loads of things I'd still like to do? Look, I... Yeah, I think rugby's going through a really tough time at the moment. Um, mm. You know, for from a concussion point of view, from a structure point of view, and yeah. Um, but I think it's still at its core a fantastic sport. I think if you look around uh, school sides, uh, regional club sides, the grassroots, it's still that great social sport that um, yeah. brings people together, teaches people great uh, work. You know family core values in terms of hard work discipline you know you see all the little kids still picking up all the cones all the balls going getting the flags helping around you know parents take them down they spend all day down the rugby club you know Mia and Lena are at Minch and it's quite hard to get them yeah. to go all the time but uh, I don't think there's gonna be an issue with Lucas um no and to be right. no. Uh, yeah you know he just loves diving into anything so hopefully he's going to be suited for rugby um so, and i think you know with the podcast what we're trying to do is is trying to highlight all this great stuff about about what rugby is and make people see you know i think i think there's got to be a big change in in the mm. elite level of the game to make it more uh attractive to the younger market and you know, less of the bob. I know there's always barber wearers who are going to go and have come out. Of, you know, you know, and it's certain <laughs> businesses that sponsor. So, you know, we've got some great yeah. companies that sponsor it, but yeah, it's still uh, fundamentally there's there's issues. You know, with Worcester and Wasp folding. Um, you know, you can see that it's not set up right, and it was yeah. it was sort of thrown together in '96, and and we haven't really got it sorted since. And you know, I think, uh, yeah, I think trying to highlight the, the problems and be a part of the, the fixture is a, is a good thing with our with our podcast because we do it in an honest way and we've got bigger plans for how we can possibly expand into that and uh, and hopefully yeah, that will happen. Well, well, good luck with that because it, it is brilliant and I think you're right, it's, a, it's an honest um, appraisal of, of what you think about things and, and, and that comes across so I think that, you know, if that expands and, and you can keep doing that and take it to new places so good luck with that. It's, yeah. um, it's good um so we've i say this every time we've talked and talked we've, we've nearly been talking for an hour it's absolutely flown and um i'm so grateful for your time because you are busy I'm, I'm you know i know you've been a, around around to places and trying to trying to fit you fit your yeah. fit us into the schedule well, being a talent well, so but it's, it's one of those where it's been a, a long week but then when you say you know because i worked for a hospitality company as well i did four you know four yeah. days at cheltenham then go to ireland and then I nipped to the USA and then back. It was just like, as one does. Yeah, it, it, yeah, <laughs> it's uh, it, yeah, real hard work. But yeah, it's it's been it's been more hard on on yeah, hospitality is yeah. all about hosting, so it's a bit more hard on my liver, well, probably. <laughs> 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 and, and the voice because you got to yeah. be talking and yeah, glad handed. But, thank you ever so much. I mean, last couple of questions because we've been talking for ages. Um, and also, it's flashed up on here. The under 16s if you could give them a shout out, they've got into the second day of Rosslyn Park Seven. I saw, I saw um, the, I saw the nice, the nice graphics of them all walking forward and folding their arms. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Oh well, well done. So, uh, for the under 16s going through to day two. Those guys. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Keep it going. Um, as I say, just keep having fun, play hard, uh, and you'll get you what you deserve. Yeah, and good luck to them. Um, any, any. So, last question. I ask everyone this. If you could go back in time and, and give young Mike a tap on the shoulder and, and, and give him a bit of advice, you know, knowing knowing now what he didn't know then, what, what if anything, would you say to him to to encourage him on his way? Um, I think I think I'd always well, one thing which I well, it always pops to my mind is ask more questions and mm. don't worry don't worry about them being stupid questions because if you you don't ask them and you don't get the answer that you were you were trying to find i think that's what i always say to it's so easy as a kid to get embarrassed about asking a question yeah you think yeah, and it, yeah. it's even worse as an adult um you know i always i remember doing the jump with joey essex and i was amazed at the question he asked but then a couple of times he asked questions because he just asked the most obvious question but a couple <laughs> of times 
But then a couple of times he asked a question that I was wanting to ask, but didn't want to ask because yeah. I thought it was a stupid question. Uh, and that's all I to say to Mia because you're never wrong if you ask a question. You just you okay. just find out what's yeah. right. Um, and it's an educational piece. And I think it's I think we're so scared of of being perceived as being thick or stupid or mm. whatever. And it's not because if no one asks questions, we'd never find anything. Out. Um, that, so that that brilliant. would be the thing I would, you know. And, cha- and challenge people, but in the right way. Uh, challenge, mm. I'd like to challenge people more. And, you know, uh, there's a couple of times where, you know, I always think in 2011, I got, when I got dropped for the the France court final, I knew I sh- shouldn't have got dropped and I should have challenged Jono. But obviously the, the lead up to that, I played rubbish against Scotland the week before. And, but I, mm. I always felt that I needed to be, I should have been in that team and, you know, so always challenge people when you when you feel that you're wrong, but do it in the right in the right way where it's where it is a question rather than and than anything else. Yeah, that that's absolutely brilliant. Um, when you are next in Wakefield, please do call in and say hello, and whenever that is, and love to the family and and all best. Thank you. And uh, I've seen them for a very long time, but uh, yeah. I hope they would remember me. I remember yeah, them. Yeah, they definitely and, would. And, uh, and uh, so. All the very best hey, to, and to you and your family. Thanks for having me. And I'm really grateful for you doing this um, because, as I said, I know you're busy, but I think it's it's just been a pleasure. Um, and so I look forward to seeing you again someday and, and keeping in touch. Um, I know you'd like to come to an event one of these days. We've talked yeah. about that. Um, but uh, one one of these days, I'll, I'll buy you a pint at, at an old yeah, yeah. dinner. And uh, yeah. Have you got one of the ties? That was another thing I wanted to ask. Have you got an old staff tie somewhere? I'm not sure. I, I might have. I'm not sure I have or... Well, know. if you haven't, let us I'll know. have a look. No. I'll have a look. If you haven't, because we'll, I we'll get in, you on. Because I was in Leeds. I was in. Uh, I was in Leeds the day before the Sabs dinner, actually, and then because I uh-huh. uh, and then because I saw uh, quite a few. That's where I saw a few of the guys who were going the next day. But I couldn't. I oh, know it was at a lunch. They were going there that night, and I couldn't do it because mm. I was going to meet my parents. But um, yeah, no, it'd be it'd be good to get back and see somewhere. It'd be lo- lovely to see you at an event uh, uh, whenever you can make it. So. Thank you again um, so much for, for joining us. It's been a real pleasure and really, really insightful and instructive and, and interesting and just great to see you again and after all these years. It's good. As you can see now with my, my vast uh, bookcase behind, it's, it's a real bookcase, yeah? It's not just wallpaper. Real bookcase. Oh, no. yeah. um, <laughs> all um, the learning, yeah. learnings behind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's my favourite yeah. bookcase, the one where you can't get a book. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> who said that? Uh, buy me a pint. Perfect. Yeah. Buy me a pint in the college. That'll work. <laughs> Thank you. No um, worries. The recording goes out on Instagram on the school account, so people can watch it back. And, and I'm sure, I'm sure there'll be clips and, and and bits and bobs around the place. But um, it's been a genuine pleasure, and and we we got there in the end. I know we were a little bit late starting, so thank yeah, you to everyone. Fault. Um, Apologies. That's joined us. And, well, I didn't know what to do when you said I'm going to be late. It's like, well, do I go on? Do I not? It's, uh, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so we say it's done. So we got the go ahead. And it's worked perfectly. So um thanks again and great to see you. All uh, the best. No and Cheers, man. Cheers, Mike. Bye.